I just had a meeting yesterday about an ACT study um, from 2009 that found um, a disconnect between what post-secondary, so college-level economics professors, instructors said was needed and what was being taught in the high school. ACT said that the gap was, uh, their quote, was unacceptable. And I just wondered if you had a suggestion of um, why that is the case when we have, at least in Minnesota, for instance, Minnesota was one of the 15 states in the study. We have such an, a, a solid link between MCEE and um, you know, universities with the directors being university professors. Because it was very concerning to me, the, the findings. At ACT, and I haven't experienced those findings whatsoever, in fact, anecdotally, which doesn't carry much weight, as you explained to us, um, <laughs> I see the exact opposite, but their findings were that it was an unacceptable disconnect. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, certainly I'm not aware of the exact uh, exact study to which you refer. So, you know, my comments will have to be taken with that in light. In, in light of that, um, you know, I, I, I'm going to respond. You know, in terms of the way we think about these kinds of problems of the Fed, which is, you know, you identify that a gap is unacceptable, but then you have to dig down and, and get granular, as we like to say, of the Fed, and, and try to figure out what are the areas exactly that are the problem areas, and then try to fill those as best we can, you know, using, I think, vehicles like the MCE to, to figure out what the, what the gaps are and then try to fill those gaps. You know, the term unacceptable, you know, it's, it's eye-catching, and it's a way to convey concern, and it's good, but it, it's not, it's not, it can't, it's not the end. You have to dig down and figure out what exactly are the, the, the problem areas and then use those to, to, to fill in. But you know, that's, that's vague, but it's partly because I just don't know the details of the study. Um, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the very nice comments about the Minnesota Council. Um, if I, since I'm given this opportunity, I'm going to take the opportunity to ask you a question that's more related to the current economic crisis, if that's all right. And I'm just wondering um, what impact you believe, or the Fed believes, uh, the sovereign debt crisis in the EU is having on the U.S. economy, and what steps or considerations the Fed is taking to in their deliberations? Well, I think that uh, those those are excellent questions. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but I, you know, I, I I think that the the way that uh, you know Europe. And I talked about this last year. Unfortunately, I talked about it last year, and it's, I'm talking about it again this year. Um, I, I think what's happening in Europe ends up affecting the U.S. economy in two distinct ways. And one is sort of, sort of a direct macroeconomic effect that if Europe has, is struggling in terms of growth, there's less demand for um, uh, the goods we export for them, and that it, it, that, that that puts a, a damper on on what we're going to be doing in terms of our our economic performance. That channel is relatively small. You know, that direct, Europe is one of many trading partners we have. You know, obviously it's a, a, a depressing effect, but it's, it's not a major effect. The bigger effect is through the financial, financial system. That um, right now there, there, there's uncertainties about Greek sovereign debt. And those have spilled over into some other countries' sovereign debt as well. Um, then there are financial institutions in Europe that hold that financial, that, 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 that sovereign debt, and they're, you know, they're, I think investors are concerned about um, probably some of those as well. The way that reflect, has shown up in the U.S. Uh, directly is that uh, we've seen a decline in equities um, since the, the end of June, and, uh, and in term, maybe even more directly, and I think uh, we've seen it in measures of volatility in the, in the stock market. Um, there's what's known as the volatility index, which uh, CBOE produces, and it's traded basically as a way to trade on uh, uh, is using back out volatility measures out of the options being traded in the S&P, and that is um, uh, very elevated right now, um, and so that's I, I peaked I think around just a little bit uh, below 50 in early August, but even now it's still around 30 and. In June, it was closer to something like 15. Okay, so that is a measure of the level of uncertainty, I think, in, in financial markets. You know, my baseline um, scenario is one where um, Europe continues to make the steps that I think are, are necessary. They face, I think, enormous political challenges. Uh, you know, they've 
17 different countries that have to be brought along board. But they have been making steps as we go along, and um, I think they will continue to do so. Um, you know, they might not move as rapidly as we might like, but they face, I think, very big challenges in, in moving uh, uh, rapidly. So and my baseline forecast is one where they're, they're able to continue to do that. But certainly, there is a, a, a downside scenario where the economic events move more rapidly than the political uh, um, response, uh, uh, faster than the political response is able to, to develop. And that's one where we have um, you know, more of a financial spillover then coming from Europe into to maybe affecting our, our own country. You know, and, and there I think that uh, well, this, is, this is something that would affect the US economy. The Fed would have to respond, I think, uh, in an appropriate fashion. And I think we have some experience with tools that we would be appropriate from, from our own, uh, from the, the, the global financial crisis that took place in, in 2007, 2009. Um, one thing we're already doing is that um, we, we are engaged in central bank swaps with the ECB. We basically swap dollars for euros. They turn around and lend those dollars out on an as-needed basis in, 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 uh, onto European entities. And that's one way that we're, we're partnering with Europe to try, to try to keep things under control. I heard you speak at the Carlson School last month, and you shared with that group that your personal model shows uh, an, in, an improvement in the unemployment rate from 9.1%, I don't want to be quizzed on this, to 8.5 or 8.4. I wonder if your model has changed uh, in the last month. No, I, I would say it's roughly the same. You're t this is a time period that uh, would be, be an improvement that would be uh, taking us to the end of 2012. So. You know, it'll be roughly around eight and a half still. Um, I think a lot of the news that's come forward since that point in time has been positive. And so, but, but you know, it's positive relative to a, a situation where we might have been expecting uh, news not to be so good. So it, basically, I would say that I'm still going to be around that eight and a half range by the end of, by the end of 2012. I'm a strong believer in the independence of the Fed, and are you have do you have any concerns about the continuing or ongoing independence of the Fed, uh, given leg legislators' predilections? I, I, I would say no. I think that um, I think there's a lot of interest in what the Fed is is engaged in um, right now, and it has been true for the last th three years or so, and. And um, we've been doing, uh, been engaged in a bunch of unconventional policies, and it really comes back to education. Comes back to communication and education. You know, I, I think we've been uh, probably better at thinking up the policies than communicating about them and explaining them. And, uh, and I understand why that happens. You know, you know, especially September two thousand eight. You know, you're trying to save the world. I, and I wasn't. You know, I'm not talking about myself here. I was. I was uh, not president of the Minneapolis Fed at that point. But there were others in the Federal Reserve System who were you know, basically trying to salvage the financial system at that point in time. So they're trying to operate at a very fast rate of speed. With that said, I think that you know, our failure to communicate as effectively as we might like about what we were doing, how we were doing it, and why we were doing it, I think that's, that has, um, you know, it leaves us with some challenge, communication challenges on an ongoing basis. But you know, I don't think criticism of the things that we've done, um, our concerns about the things we've done, translate into a loss of independence. I think the citizens of the country, uh, including our political leaders, should be interested and engaged in what, mo what monetary policy is doing. And uh, so, I, 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 so I don't have a problem with this ongoing um, interest and, and um, in, in the kinds of actions we're taking. And it, I think it behooves us then to respond by doing an even better job than we're doing on, on the communication side. Mariana, if you answer two more questions, I think you're going to create another crop of economists, which you said you would not do. <laughs> so let's take one and maximum two if it's absolutely burning. OK, so as a classroom teacher, what is an effective way to address the recent Occupy Wall Street and kind of connecting back to the former question about some of the animosity toward the Federal Reserve Bank. Yeah, 
I think that, so, so uh, I think first of all, I think in terms of the, the, what's, the way I think about Occupy Wall Street is, and, and some of the similar, similar movements that are springing up around the world is that the pace of the recovery has been distressingly slow. And, that, and that's a, a frustration that, frankly, I share. I think the, the pace of the recovery has been distressingly slow. Um, in terms of the actions of the Federal Reserve System, you know, I think it's very, con it's very challenging to, 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 to uh, explain, but you have to do the best we can. And it's because the, why it's hard to explain is it requires something that's near and dear to economists' hearts, the, a counterfactual analysis. It requires a saying, being able to explain, suppose the Fed had not taken the actions, the, provided the, the liquidity facilities that it did in, in uh, 2008 and 2009. Um, Suppose that those hadn't been in place. Suppose it had not provided that kind of liquidity to the markets. What would have happened? Well, we would have had a much bigger shock to the financial system. Even though unemployment is, uh, is, is high today, disturbingly high, uh, unemployment would be even higher to, uh, if the Fed had not taken the actions it did. So I think it's, but I, I think those kind of counterfactuals, I think they're very natural to economists. But uh, they are much more challenging to explain. But of course, that's the bread and butter of our subject is the counterfactual. You know, suppose a shock hits the demand curve and it shifts. What happens? That's, what, that's a counterfactual. And that's the, 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 here the counterfactual is about suppose the Fed had not done, set up the kind of liquidity facilities that they, they, ended up do, uh, they had set up in, in 2008, 2009. I think we have pretty good descriptions on our own website um, about what those liquidity facilities look like and how they worked. And um, you know, and, and why, why, and why those were, were set up to, uh, to, to to try to support the, the financial system at that point in time. Excellent. One more, please. Back there. I think the hands were up early. Back there. Um, I'm going to be bringing my students down here uh, for a a tour in January, and I was just wondering your thoughts, practically speaking, what is like the most important concept you want them to understand about the Fed? What do you want me to teach them before I bring them down here? Like, what should they be looking for? Wow, that's a that's a that's a tough question. You know, I, I, I'll say that the thing that has I I sort of knew it before I became president, but it's really struck me over and over again since I became president that really the bottom line of this organization is integrity, and it's and. It's integ what integrity means is that decisions are always about being grounded in data. We have we're always about grounding research. We're trying to address things in an apolitical, data-based, integrity-oriented uh, way. And that's, that's uh, the message that I wish I could convey to, to more of the American people on an ongoing basis, that somehow they could look inside our organization and see sort of the dedication and the integrity that, that our employees bring on an everyday basis. So if I, if I had to summarize it in, in that one word, it would be that. Um, in terms of an economics lesson, it's, 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 that's a very challenging thing to say because I ask about, I'll, I'll just, this is not the most important thing by any means, but it is something that, that's been troubling me recently, so I'll just share it with you. That um, I think one of, the, one of the things that's really interesting in terms of monetary economics is that uh, the Fed has created a, um, um, a large amount of bank reserves in the past, uh, expanded the liabilities in a uh, large way over, uh, since uh, September 2008. Uh, by over $2 trillion. And, you know, there's a lot of fears out there that that creation of that, those reserves is going to somehow be inflationary. I think, and, and if you, the problem, and I think if you read a lot of textbooks, you, you see the, the creation of, of, of uh, um, outside money in this way, monetary base in this fashion, it has to be inflationary. But that's no longer true. It's longer true because there's been a fundamental change to the monetary system in the United States that took place in October 2008, and that's that the Fed is now allowed to pay interest on reserves. That changes everything. Now you can maintain a large balance sheet. You can have lots of, 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 of uh, outside money in the system. But by, if you change the interest rate enough on that, it will not spill into the, into the broader economy and create inflationary pressures. Uh, it's a little, <laughs> maybe it's too detailed, but I, that, <laughs> But I, I, but I honestly think this is a huge lesson to try. To, this is a, exactly the kind of communication point that we need to be better at at the Fed because many citizens look at the creation of the reserves that we've engaged in, the, the, the liabilities we've engaged in, and think, 
the Fed has been inflationary. And you'll hear that criticism um, from a number of observers. Where is it coming from? Well, it's not coming from the inflation rate. We all know that. The inflation rate's um, basically 2%, a little under that even over the last three or four years. It's coming from the fact that we've expanded the set of liabilities in a big way. So we have to be better at explaining why that's not inflationary. And somehow it always ends up being as technical as I just was. But, but that's it. So we have to somehow get it from that technical level down to a place where we can hammer it home to people. OK. <laughs> Let me know if, <laughs> how that goes. Thanks a lot.